Hello, welcome to this webinar on uh, the uh, situation uh, in the Ukraine and the uh, war uh, between Russia and the Ukraine and the involvement of uh, many other powers in, uh, in, in the conflict. Uh, today is, of course, um, uh, a day where another phase of the war in the Ukraine uh, starts, a rather tragic uh, situation where many more losses are going to be expected. Uh, we are not going to be a military analyst, so it's very difficult for us to assess uh, the military uh, evolution of the conflict. Uh, but um, our task will be to look at the economic situation, uh, both in the short, medium and long run, uh, in terms of the impact it has on the Ukraine economy, on the Russian economy, and on EU, um, uh, of course, there's quite a lot of differentiation there. Um, of uh, the economic uh, uh, impact, of course, will uh, depend on the outcome of the war, uh, whose duration uh, is difficult to assess, and of course, also the impact on what sort of regions uh, will remain or will become occupied uh, by Russian forces. Uh, so I think there is an, of course, iterative uh, issue of assessing the economics and especially in the medium and long term and the uh, evolution of the military conflict. Um, the occasion of uh, having this webinar is that the Vienna Institute just published uh, a rather big policy report on uh, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. Uh, it's a 60 page uh, uh, piece which uh, we will cover uh, initially when we start with the uh, uh, presentations. Uh, and it uh, covers exactly uh, the situation in terms of these three blocks of impact on the Ukraine, on the Russian economy and uh, the EU. Uh, and we are going to follow in our discussion in this webinar, uh, that sort of structure. Uh, probably just on, uh, on how we will proceed, uh, Richard Grieveson, who is Deputy Director of the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies, will start us off uh, with a short summary of the main findings of the report. And after that, we will uh, continue with uh, the panelists to cover uh, the various blocks of uh, analysis uh, and bring in additional information and additional debate on these issues, um, Ukraine, Russia, EU, and of course the further policy steps which are uh, unfolding, which should be unfolding uh, over the medium or long term in the evolving new geopolitics, which we are witnessing now, uh, not only in Europe, but even at the glo global level. Um, I should also mention, apart from this report, the Vienna Institute has put in a new section on the on its website called War uh, in the Ukraine. And it uh, continuously updates important statistical indicators of what is happening uh, in these uh, various blocks in the Ukraine, in Russia, and uh, in impact on the EU, uh, picking out uh, newest projections on GDP developments, interest rates, exchange rates, price developments in important commodities like oil, gas, uh, copper, wheat, uh, sugar, financial spillover effects on sea economies, etc. So it's an interestingly and very up-to-date uh, section of uh, our website, which you might want to look at. I should also mention that this report I've talking about can be freely downloaded from the WIW's website. So let me come to um, introduce shortly the uh, panelists, and I'm very grateful for them taking the time uh, to participate in this webinar. Let me start with uh, Ilona Sologub, who joins us at the moment from Washington, uh, but she uh, works at the Kiev School of Economics, which is uh, the prime uh, economics uh, uh, school uh, in, uh, in, in the Ukraine. She has been working there since 2010 in this uh, now director of political and economic research uh, at the Kiev School of Economics. She is also a scientific editor of Vox Ukraine, which quite a few of you might have been assessing. Um, it, uh, its prime task before the war was really to monitor uh, the reform processes and this, partly the stalling and partly the uh, progress in reform steps undertaken in the Ukraine economy. But it has quickly shifted also towards a very up-to-date uh, monitoring of developments during the war. So it's well worth uh, looking at this. 
Uh, Ilona also frequently publishes with uh, very well-known uh, uh, macroeconomist, uh, Ukrainian macroeconomist who teaches at Berkeley, uh, Yuri Gorodnichenko, uh, and there are very interesting pieces of joint uh, research there. Uh, we then have uh, Maria de Merzis, who many of you uh, will know. She's deputy director of uh, Bruegel, Bruegel for uh, quite a few years by now, I guess four or five years, <laughs> something like that. Um, she uh, is very active in almost all policy fields which Bruegel covers at the moment or in many of the fields and very active in webinars uh, like this one. <laughs> so very grateful that you take your time. Uh, previously, she worked at the European Commission and at the Dutch Central Bank's uh, bank, and uh, is really an important pillar of Bruegel's rather impressive uh, presence in policy debates uh, in, uh, in, in, in Europe at the European level. And uh, uh, then we have Dirk Verbecken, uh, who is now a senior economist and principal administrator of uh, a support unit, economic uh, governance support unit of the European Parliament. They work, uh, it's a team of about 10 economists who work uh, in uh, support of whatever uh, is needed for uh, European parliamentary uh, agenda. Uh, before uh, joining the parliament, he was an economist at the European Commission at uh, DG ECFIN and uh, covered uh, quite a large number of countries, quite a few of them uh, of great interest to us in the webinar, the Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, uh, also Turkey, and also China, Lithuania, etc. cetera. Um, he, uh, this, well, he's also involved to some extent in um, uh, disseminating uh, pieces of research and daily information on the uh, development of the uh, Ukraine-Russia uh, uh, crisis and war situation, uh, also covering uh, the Russian uh, press uh, and how they report on the various aspects of the um, war and uh, implications of that. So uh, let me just remind you that if you want to um, uh, put in your questions or uh, your uh, comments on this debate, please put it under Q&A, and I'm going to um, monitor uh, your questions and try to raise them to the panelists. So as I mentioned before, we're going to start off with a short uh, summary of the, uh, of the report by Richard Grivison that will be in the form of a PowerPoint presentation. And then we start the debates in terms of a number of rounds amongst the panelists, and I bring in questions and comments from the audience. So Richard, why don't you start off? Thank you, Michael. Uh, I will start by sharing my screen. I hope everybody can see that in yeah. mode. So thank you, Michael, for the, for the introduction. Um, I am the deputy director here at uh, Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies. Um, I worked on this report, but I'm by no means the only author. So I have the honor to present it on behalf of a, of a large uh, project team. I will mention everybody uh, at the end. And this report, we tried to do three things. Uh, we looked at the invasion of Ukraine and the assessment of the humanitarian, economic, and the financial impact on Ukraine, Russia, and then the rest of Europe. And I will try to present the main uh, conclusions uh, now as an impetus, as a starting point for the debate. So I should talk for 15, maximum 20 minutes, um, looking at basically the main conclusions of, of, of the policy note that we did. So I will start with the humanitarian impact. We're very um, keen, always, you know, that, that is the most important thing here. We always start with that. Then inflation and GDP fallout, then the financial contagion as it relates to Central and Eastern Europe more broadly, the trade impact, the labor market impact, and then finally looking ahead. And I think this will be an interesting part of the debate afterwards to the medium term structural changes that well probably we already see and that we expect in the future this will uh, this will bring about so starting with the humanitarian impact now these numbers are already a couple of weeks old and we know the situation is is uh, is very dynamic uh, at the time we did the report we assessed that about 20 million people were living in conflict regions in ukraine so areas of the country that had been directly impacted by the war about 20 million people lived in those areas out of a population of 41, so more or less half the country. And our assessment at that point, 
things can of course change was that up to 29 million people could in the end be directly affected by this so more or less three quarters of the population of the country this is an enormous uh, humanitarian uh, crisis that we are that we are facing a colleague of ours who's quite specialist in, in conflict economics try to project forward and think about what this could mean in terms of the human scale of, 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 the, of, the, of the effects. Uh, we thought about this in, in, two, in two ways, in terms of people internally displaced by the conflict and then in terms of refugees, so people who leave Ukraine and go elsewhere. At the time that we did this, there were six and a half million people internally displaced in Ukraine and about three and a half million refugees. This number has certainly increased even in the last couple of weeks. And in a kind of worst case scenario, uh, we, we found that probably this could be, in terms of refugees, so number of people who leave Ukraine, three times as, as much as the refugee crisis in the EU of 2015-16. So the, the, in the end, more people will be internally displaced than leave as refugees, but just looking at the refugees, we're looking at something something very, very uh, significant. We know, chart on the right, uh, most people are going to Poland. That's definitely still the case. But we also know that, and we don't have great data on this at the moment, that a lot of those people will not stay in Poland. Uh, people will move on to other parts uh, of, of Western Europe as well. But certainly, the, the main impact in terms of where refugees initially arrive will be felt in neighboring countries and, and other countries of Central uh, and Eastern Europe. What this means for Ukraine in economic sense is, is pretty dramatic. So this table is a lot of information. I'm not going to go through all of it. What we tried to do is to sum relevant economic indicators for the regions that had at that point already been directly affected by the conflict. So if you go towards the bottom of the table in the orange box, I've, I've highlighted that row where we sum for the selected regions. So we're talking about, as I said, 19, 20 uh, million people already more than half of the country's pre-war GDP, so 53% of, of GDP in the directly affected areas, 43% of industrial production, half of goods exports, three quarters of services exports, third of agricultural production, and about two thirds of the FDI stock. Altogether, the effect will certainly be bigger than this. We know, for example, with agricultural production, even if things can still be produced, they cannot necessarily be brought to the ports uh, and exported because of the conflict. So we're talking about a very dramatic economic impact. We are updating our forecast at the moment, we publish them next week, but if you look at the projections out at the moment from, from major forecasters, we're looking at a decline in Ukrainian GDP of a third to a half probably for this year. So something really very serious. When it comes to Russia, also a big economic uh, hit, self-inflicted of course but nevertheless nevertheless significant it's quite a disaster for the russian economy we think gdp will fall by at least seven eight percent uh, this year inflation will go to 30 percent by the end of the year of course huge uncertainty with these projections we think you know 10 even 12 percent gdp contraction uh, this year is certainly possible you know because of sanctions because of the interest rate shock because of the initial uh, currency depreciation uh, shock that the economy faced. If we put this in context, and we went through here different crises that Russia's faced in the last year, so back the last 30 years now, a decline of, let's say it's 10%. I mean, that would be the biggest one-year contraction for Russia since the early 90s. That would be bigger in terms of one year since 2008. Peak to trough might be also somewhere comparable. Back in the early 90s, the transition shock, the Russian economy attracted by 15%. We think that's a, a very extreme upper case, uh, upper bound uh, case for this crisis, probably won't get, get to be that bad, but certainly around 10%, as I said, is possible contraction for the Russian economy uh, this year. What it means for the rest of Europe? Well, we look at the, at the implications for the EU as a whole, but we also zoomed in quite a bit on Central and Eastern Europe. This is an area where we have a lot of specialism, but of course, an area where a lot of the first effects uh, are, in terms of Europe as a whole are going to be felt. The main thing we see at the moment, and this will probably remain the main thing through the year, is inflation. We see already high inflation in this region has become even higher as a result of the war, much higher commodity prices. I've highlighted here on the chart, so starting with the headline, uh, Harmonized Index of Consumer Prices compiled by Eurostat, 
focusing on the Baltic states because they're obviously, well, at the moment, at least particularly uh, affected. We already have double digit headline inflation in Estonia and in Lithuania, getting that way in Latvia as well. It's much higher than for the, for the euro area as a whole. That's the dotted uh, gray line uh, lower down. A lot of this is energy. We hear a lot about energy. Uh, that's I think, a pretty well-known story, but we also emphasize in the, in, in the note what's happening with food prices, very significant developments uh, as well. Russia and Ukraine are both important producers, exporters of quite a few different foodstuffs. This chart shows within the HICP the breakdown for flowers and cereals, which have been very much affected uh, in, in, in this war. And you can see, for example, in Latvia, in this component, we already have inflation of more than 40% uh, year on year. Again, way above uh, the euro area as a whole. And of course, especially poorer households where food makes up a, a pretty high share of, of, the, of the total basket of spending, this is quite a squeeze already. This is very serious for, especially for, for poorer people uh, within, within the EU. And we see already lots of governments in the region implementing or at least considering uh, price controls for, uh, for that reason. The financial contagion is something we looked at a lot in the note. We also look at on, the, on this section of the website that, that, that Michael mentioned. We did see a big impact on currencies initially. We saw a sell-off in currencies right across Central and Eastern Europe when this first started. But you can see from the chart on the left, if you take the first quarter of the year as a whole, the impact on most currencies was actually not too big. We saw uh, currencies come back uh, quite a lot after the first couple of weeks of the inflation of, of the invasion. Uh, Czechia had had, so by the end of March, no depreciation at all for the year. Uh, places like Hungary, Romania, uh, fairly limited. Obviously, along with Russia and Ukraine, there are other countries that have been affected, Turkey being a very obvious example. But in general, maybe the financial contagion is not what it looked like it was going to be in the first couple of weeks in the rest of Central and Eastern Europe. A big part of that is because governments or central banks in particular have been able to step in. They have policy measures they can use. And one thing is that reserve uh, level of reserves in the region are actually pretty high. So if you look at the chart on the right, especially a lot of the countries with floating currencies, so places like Serbia, Poland, Romania, have pretty high uh, import cover in terms of their reserves. And we have seen central banks in lots of the region intervene to stabilize, uh, stabilize their currencies. In terms of the trade impact, uh, we looked at the, the share of trade, so exports on the, on the left, imports on the right, which either go to or come from uh, Russia and Ukraine across Central and Eastern Europe. Now, there are lots of countries uh, which have trade relations, obviously, with Russia and Ukraine, but for the most of them, it's not a very significant amount as a share of the total. There are exceptions to that, like Belarus, uh, of course, some of the Baltic states on the export side, Kazakhstan, Moldova on the import side, but in general, countries in Europe, in the rest of Europe, don't have especially significant uh, trading relationships with Russia and Ukraine. Uh, as a whole. And a lot of this is because of the decoupling since 2013. So especially for the EU member states, including the EU member states of Central and Eastern Europe, there was this partial decoupling of, of trade and investment links after 2013 because of Crimea, the exchange of sanctions. So if you look at trade as a share of the total, FDI as a share of the total with Russia after that, after 2013, you see in rather pretty much everywhere uh, a clear decline. So that limits some of the, some of the impact. And our scientific director, Robert Steyer, did some calculations as part of, a part of the paper. Looking at here, I've shown Central and Eastern European countries and then some of the Western European countries like Germany or, or Sweden uh, or Finland. What would happen with this big shock to Russian demand, so a 10% decline uh, in Russian demand? How would that affect the GDP of these, of these other uh, EU member states and, and of Turkey? Um, via the trade channel. And you can see that the impact is, is very meager, talking about maybe 0.2% uh, of, of GDP in most cases. So in terms of the direct trade impact, it's, it's quite uh, limited. Where that changes, of course, is if we go to energy and particularly uh, gas. Everybody's very familiar with, with the story this chart shows by now. So whether it's Western Europe, which are the gray bars here, Central and Eastern Europe, the orange bars, there's enormous, uh, enormous reliance on Russian uh, gas. 100% of, of gas in, in quite a lot of case, cases came from 
from uh, comes from from Russia, and of course there, if if the gas is turned off, uh, then of course the impact would be uh, much bigger. We looked at this in the paper. We think you know certainly a lot of countries would suffer a recession if 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 Europe turned off gas from Russia right now. The winter is passing. The impact on households would be would be less and less and less as as time goes on. And this fiscal space, uh, certainly in a country like Germany, there's fiscal space to cushion the blow for the poorest households. There is vulnerability in certain parts of EU industry, that's clear. And I mean, I don't have any inside information, but probably that's a big reason why it hasn't happened uh, already. Our estimate is it would take about three percentage points from euro area growth this year. So recession, probably a bit more than that in a lot of Central and Eastern Europe, but the bottom line, at least as far as I'm concerned, the, the moral case to do this is, is pretty clear. The costs, especially for, for Germany, are, are manageable and, and, uh, and we should do it. On the labor market, and our colleague Marina did a really nice section in the report. I encourage you to, to have a look at it. I can only briefly summarize it here. At the moment, we're talking about the refugee crisis. And within the EU, the people who are arriving are refugees. They need to be supported as refugees. But if policy is enacted uh, well, if, if and in the early signs, I think, from the, or we think from the European Commission temporary protection scheme are good, then a lot of the refugees can be integrated into EU labor markets. And certainly for a lot of countries in Central and Eastern Europe, including Poland, where a lot of refugees are, are arriving, uh, this could be quite important in the context of major labor shortages that those countries are facing. So there are challenges. Of course, most of the refugees are, are women with, with young children, elderly people. EU labor markets themselves are not always in, in the best shape after the, after the pandemic. And there's a question about transferability of skills, even though Ukrainian refugees are actually on average better educated than, than, than the EU average, that doesn't automatically translate to immediate transferability, of course. But the assessment, especially from our colleague Marina, who's an expert on this, all of this is manageable. And from next year, this can actually be a, a labor market supply shock positive shock uh, in, in large parts of, uh, of, the, of the EU. Turn to the last section of the presentation uh, now, and then we go to the discussion. So some first thoughts on the medium term. Um, highly speculative, of course, um, but you know it's very important, we think, to start thinking about this already. I think the main message here is this is a major acceleration in an economic sense a major acceleration of a decoupling between Russia and the West, which started in 2013. We see that in a lot of indicators. It's been going on for a decade now, but this is a dramatic major uh, intensification uh, of that. February 2022 was probably the swan song for broader European economic and financial integration. So in, in, the, in the continental sense of Europe rather than, rather than the EU itself. Uh, for Ukraine, unfortunately, a divided future looks quite likely. You know, we don't know how the war will, will end, but it looks like the country will be in some way divided. There will be a major rebuilding job in, in the unoccupied part of Ukraine and unfortunately stagnation, decline, further outward migration from the, from the Russian occupied part. For Russia, we've thought for many years, you know, there's a serious structural problem in the economy. There are big reasons why Russia's trend growth rate anyway is so low. The medium term outlook was anyway not very good. It's even worse now. There's a stronger reliance on China, certainly, but that is not a panacea by any means for Russia. And China certainly cannot, sorry, that is my phone. China certainly cannot uh, replace all of the, the Western technological uh, transfer that Russia will lose. For the, what Michael said and called it to start the in-between countries so for the non-EU member states of Central and Eastern Europe the balancing act that countries like Serbia or Turkey pursue is obviously going to become much more difficult if we think about it purely as economists looking at the economic and financial um, incentives the direction of travel of these countries is fundamentally westwards I mean in an economic sense for a country like Serbia for a country like Turkey the EU is overwhelmingly more uh, important uh, than, than Russia or, or, or indeed China um, uh, are or are likely to be anytime soon. For the rest of the EU, uh, well, at the moment, in terms of energy, it's whatever it takes. But in the medium term, this is a push for the green transition. Pretty sure uh, about that. 
more defense spending, uh, of course, and in a way of the, of the peace dividend. And then for long-term investors, I think there's a question now about increased caution, especially, for example, in the Baltic states, how this changes the calculation of, of longer term investors that could be in a negative way. And a lot of that will probably depend on, on US politics and what happens after the next election, because at the moment, the US security commitment is not in doubt, but we don't know how that will develop uh, in the future. So final slide, and then I finish policy priorities uh, and this lead on, I think, to, to a lot of the discussion policy priorities for the EU. In Ukraine, of course, immediate priority is to address the humanitarian crisis, support the government as, as much as, as possible. And I think that, you know, that means weapons as, as well as everything else. Once the war ends, the US and the EU should be ready with a plan for the unoccupied part of Ukraine. We have in the report quite a few suggestions uh, on that. And then beyond that, stronger uh, EU economic integration with the unoccupied part of Ukraine. For the rest of Europe, Definitely short term priorities to support the poorest households through this huge spike in food and energy prices that we are seeing. Push for the green transition. Okay, right now, whatever it takes to get away from the reliance on Russian energy. But beyond that, this has to be a, a, an even bigger push for the green transition. And then an acceleration of Western Balkan EU integration. Whether that means full membership, you know, that might still be some way in the future. But for the countries that are dragging their feet on this, this must be uh, a wake up call uh, in terms of Southeast Europe. So that was it. The full report is on the website. Uh, there's a hyperlink there. You'll get these slides afterwards so you can go directly to it. As Michael mentioned, we also have this new section on the website where you can track a lot of the humanitarian, a lot of the financial indicators, more or less uh, in, in real time. We had a big project team. I wanted to, to, to acknowledge that a lot of people worked on this study. And uh, thank you for your attention. And I, I look forward to, to the debate. So thank you very much, Richard. <laughs> I think you covered quite a lot. And um, the report is a 60 page report. So there's more material <laughs> than you could cover. But so in order to handle the discussion, I think we again uh, uh, organize it in these three blocks, yeah, looking at Ukraine first and Russia and then EU and uh, the more bigger geopolitics and geoeconomics of uh, the European uh, uh, scenario and how we think certain policy steps should be taken and whether we have some uh, additional ideas on that. Um, I think, uh, well, Ukraine is really the center of attention. And uh, I think we all are involved also in our next research on working on uh, reconstruction of the Ukraine. And I think this will be our uh, big project, I think, as a follow on uh, from this report. So let me uh, give the word to Ilona as the first speaker on the first block, which is dealing with the uh, situation of the European economy uh, during the war, uh, how it survives, what needs there are, and also the medium and longer term needs of the Ukraine economy. Ilona. Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here and uh, for this report. And um, uh, I'm especially grateful that you are arguing for oil and gas embargo for Russia. This is obviously the most needed policy right now, although it can also be something like oil for food program, like there was the one that was present in Iraq uh, in the 1990s. Uh, I think this would uh, somewhat diminish the, uh, the price hike of the oil and gas and would provide a good transition to the embargo because, you know, you need on not only to limit Russia's revenues, but also its ability to buy weapons with those revenues. Uh, as for the Ukrainian economy, uh, well, we have only rough estimates and the government is also not revealing. Uh, many data uh, because, you know, this is the warrant. Uh, they are cons um, consciously um, hiding some information, uh, but uh, some surveys suggest that about 30% of enterprises are not working and about 50% more have been affected, uh, decreased their scales of operation. Uh, about 3 million people are unemployed, uh, 3 million more, I mean, um, the budget deficit is likely to be about five uh, to seven billion dollars per month. 
Uh, so this is kind of very big financial stress. Um, the government also uh, switched to some uh, emergency policies to help business and economy. Uh, thus they are helping business to relocate. They are providing some uh, one time and also monthly payments to people who lost their businesses or were forced to move within the country. And um, they've reduced uh, taxes a lot to help business. And uh, the central bank uh, has fixed the exchange rate and introduced um, currency and capital controls. And uh, we argue that these capital controls should be really now strengthened uh, so that only, only critical import is allowed and uh, perhaps uh, negotiations on the restructuring of the debt uh, should also start right now because uh, right now the main goal of uh, uh, both the government and of all the people in the country is to win and um, because i will not agree with your projection or with your i mean it's not a forecast, I think, but it's suggestion that some part of Ukraine is occup remains occupied and some part is reconstructed. I think this is not plausible scenario, because if you let Russia to get some part of Ukraine, then it will attack again. It will uh, rebuild its army uh, with the help of uh, the money that it gets. Uh, for selling its commodities and it will attack again because its final goal is destruction of Ukraine and it declared pretty clearly that it will kill millions of Ukrainians. In fact, it's already started to commit the genocide and it will not stop. Uh, so I think now the only um, possible scenario for peace is uh, winning over Russia and so um, the main priority is not even helping Ukrainian refugees or Ukrainian economy. It's the main priority is providing weapon, weapons to Ukraine, like everything it asks in order uh, to help it win. Uh, so uh, there were a few questions in the chat uh, and I would like to address those um, if I can. So the latest report of our ombudsman is uh, that over 800,000 people were forcefully relocated to Russia, of them uh, 153,000 children. And you should understand that not all these children were relocated with their parents. So it's like basically kidnapping of children. Uh, some of these people are able to return to Ukraine uh, via Baltic countries, but we uh, do not know the exact numbers. Probably they are not that big. Um, so um, probably I was, well, wasn't talking so much about economy that was expected, but really uh, the main thing now is uh, the victory because, you know, if you have Russia in some part of Ukraine, then there is not a big sense in reconstruction either. And I think uh, companies and governments will understand that whatever they build in the unoccupied part can be bombed at any, at any time. Again, uh, so, uh, and to, by the way, looking at the uh, polls and looking uh, in uh, polls in Russia, I mean, and looking at the uh, TV channels that uh, Russia, uh, um, and what is the word casted in the Russian TV channels, you can understand that Russia is already at war with NATO because uh, like more than 50% of Russians believe that NATO, NATO has attacked them. So it's no um, some kind of way to appease Russia to make some concessions in order to uh, escape uh, or to prevent that war because you know they are already fighting you. Thank you, Ilona. Yeah. Have you finished? Uh, yeah, for now, yeah. yeah, unless you have some questions. Well, they will be coming, yes. 
uh, well, you, you, you mentioned that, of course, the priority is uh, the war situation itself, but you also mentioned that there are huge fiscal needs even during the war situation you mentioned. Uh, and I think there was a rather instructive um, interview with the finance minister who said uh, there is an important uh, constraint on supporting the population and supporting businesses during the war also. Um, and uh, he mentioned actually that these needs are not necessarily satisfied in the current circumstances through uh, transfers. So we can come back to that. Maria, you want to add something on the Ukraine situation now? Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me. And of course, uh, yeah, I was listening very attentively to all the things that Ilona said, and it's really, it really is a devastating uh, to, to be going through like this. And therefore, you know, I, I really need to emphasize how much I believe the number one priority now is for the war to finish before we can think about anything else. Uh, because we need to, to stop the, the human destruction uh, above, above everything uh, before we can think about anything else. Um, uh, you know, the word peace in my view needs to be emphasized uh, tremendously in, in these days and, and try and find the ways that are going to get us there the fastest possible. And for that, I believe the EU has got a big role to play, and I'll, I'll come to that uh, in a minute. Um, so, I mean, in terms of the, you know, the, the little information that I can provide on the economic side, we are now uh, seeing uh, the, the economic impact, which is, of course, very uncertain because it, it, it's directly related to the duration of this war. And again, one more reason why the duration needs to be, uh, to be shortened and, and hopefully uh, very, very soon. Um, the VoxEQ uh, website, which is a, a compendium of uh, academics writing on various issues, has very recently published two articles in which they are arguing that the cost of reconstructing UK, which, uh, as you said, Michael, this is the, the next uh, thing to, uh, to think about, uh, is going to be between 200 and 500 billion um, uh, of the current war. That's the cost in rebuilding the current destruction. Um, uh, but there, in the in the secondary piece that they've also published, if you were to account also for previous destruction of Ukraine, cumulatively speaking, the cost could be well above one trillion. Um, and I think it's uh, it's important to sort of uh, give also our audiences uh, the the dimension. Of what does one trillion mean? Uh, the GDP of Germany is just over three trillion. So you're talking one third of the German economy. Uh, can be, again, there, these are scenarios, right, uh, can be the cost of reconstruction, the cumulative destruction, that uh, economic destruction, I mean, uh, that Ukraine has suffered. So, you know, we're talking about big numbers and, and, you know, we need to start thinking about, we by, I mean, everyone, <laughs> um, about, about how, who is going to do this, uh, who is going to help Ukraine to stand back in its, uh, in its own two feet. Um, uh, and, and of course, the big the big issue, as far as the EU is concerned, is is uh, how uh, uh, how closely Ukraine is going to be associated with the EU, uh, and uh, secondarily, uh, how Russia is going to pay for for some of this uh, for some of this, if not all of this, in terms of reconstructing that. So you will have seen a lot of discussions on this subject uh, already starting, but I think. Uh, it's very difficult to concentrate the discussion on what I would call the reparations uh, if we are still uh, fighting in quite the same extent as uh, Ilona uh, described. Uh, but again, as, as by means of starting the, the discussion, uh, and I will come back to that perhaps when we talk about the EU or, or the future, uh, the future relationships, the EU membership of Ukraine uh, is going to be an important, let me call it tool in, uh, in uh, uh, helping uh, bringing some structure and some credibility to the construction of Ukraine. I'll stop here, thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, Dirk, you want to add something on the Ukraine section? Thank you, Michael. <coughs> mm -hmm. you know, like Ilona and Maria said, there are so many uncertainties. And at the same time, we are talking about such a big amounts and such a big impact. Um, and the uncertainties like the intensity and duration of the conflict, the, the scenarios, um, are, are it makes it very difficult, as, as, as Maria said, to, to come up with something sensible. Now, it's clear that um, the reconstruction, uh, whenever it will take place, will be, uh, will, 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 we'll talk about a major amount of money. At the moment, we see that bilateral and multilateral financial support is strong. Pledges of assistance from the US, from the IMF, from the World Bank, from the EU, um, and also EU, EIB and EBRD. 
uh, but we are not talking about the amounts that the country needs. Um, and um, I mean, there is so many uncertainties, it's very difficult to say something, I would, I would say. Um, but at the moment, there is definitely the will in, in, in Europe to, to help Ukraine. Um, and as Maria said, we don't know what, the, what Russia will have to do or will be forced to do or how the, the peace will uh, be concrete. Thank you. Uh, Ilona, do you want to come back? Uh... Uh, there were no questions for me right now, but uh, I would agree with Maria that really the EU accession uh, would be the very uh, good anchor uh, to shape Ukrainian policies and politics after the war. So I am very much hope that U Ukraine will get this candidate status and then the roadmap uh, for uh, for the EU accession and this will frame its future development. So I think we will cover the issue of EU uh, accession and also the general issue of uh, in the context of the enlargement debate uh, more broadly uh, later on. Um, well, uh, I, I think it's it's interesting that uh, the main focus of the economic impact so far in the debate was very much on Russia, basically because of the sanctions one analyzed to which extent one could have a handle on through the impact on the Russian economy on the Russia's, uh, on Putin's behavior, I think, in terms of the war, I think much less has been done for evaluating actually the economic impact uh, on the Ukraine itself. So I think this part of our discussion is very important to get some idea of the orders of magnitude in terms of current uh, uh, destruction of the Ukraine economy or the non-functioning part of the Ukraine economy, what it does to uh, to which to the different parts of the economy and uh, its needs uh, further on, which indeed are uh, extremely high. <clears throat> I'm somehow reminded. <clears throat> I'm reminded of debates uh, at the beginning of transition, <clears throat> which also had enormously high <clears throat> uh, figures. On, for example, the Polish reconstruction from transition, yeah, or the. Uh, it turned out that uh, the growth dynamics <clears throat> after transition were such that um, it became. I mean, uh, there was quite a lot of support from outside, uh, for example, in uh, reducing debt and so on. But it also started to become self-financing uh, because um, I think uh, an, uh, an economy such as Ukraine was on a relatively positive growth path uh, just before the war. And I think the potential through uh, a much tighter economic integration with the EU might uh, uh, develop a rather positive economic dynamic also in structural uh, terms, or at least that's uh, the view I would take if there is, if the uh, war situation is overcome. Nonetheless, of course, any support uh, mechanisms have to be put into place in terms of infrastructure, uh, reconstruction, um, uh, uh, the facilities uh, for exporting, importing, etc. Yeah, and of course uh, the traditional tools of um, current account support um, and uh, the situation in which the fiscal situation will be in the short medium run because of the falling away of any tax base uh, during the war. So let me move on to uh, an assessment of the Russian situation as reported a bit uh, in, our, uh, in our study, in our note, but also how you see um, the interface between the development of the Russian economy, but also how it might constrain or could constrain uh, the behavior uh, of, uh, in, in political terms. Dirk, I will start with you on that. Thank you, Michael. Now, before this war started, the Russian economy was forecast to expand by almost 3%. But now it's inevitably poised to face a deep recession, um, which may become protracted depending on the continuance of the conflict and on the sanctions. Now, although the EU, which is the most important Russian energy importer, did not yet restrict imports on oil, gas, just on coal, and not on metals and many other products, disconnecting some Russian banks from SWIFT may complicate trade-related transactions between the EU and the Russian Federation, and over 300 multinationals have exited the Russian market in February, April. Uh, and in terms of their return, even if the conflict is resolved, this is far from clear. Rebuilding the broken economic and financial links could entail a complex process, and replacing the disrupted supply chains with new ones 
will be com will be a very complicated process. Now, we all have seen that the central bank has increased its key policy rate by one, more than 1,000 basis points to 20%. Government imposed capital controls. These were very major measures. Um, so we expect that private consumption and investment uh, will collapse. And that as also uh, your colleague Richard said, uh, the Russian GDP may shrink by probably, uh, well, between seven and a half and 15%, as you said, and only partially recovered in 2023. Um, a lot is dependent on the string, on the sanctions. So if the most stringent sanctions remain in place and the central bank reserves remain inaccessible, uh, growth of, potential, of Russian potential output may fall to below 1%. And this is, in, well, for the, for the 11th uh, economy in the world, it, it's, it's really very low. And this is because of low FDI, inability to explore new oil and natural gas deposits and a possible loss of major energy markets in the near future if the EU continues with gas and oil. Um, now the scope for Russia to find substitutes, as you also said in your study, is, is pretty narrow. Um, the Russian economy only accounts for around 2% of global GDP, but the consequences of this conflict will extend far beyond its border and the region, as we said, through energy and commodity price shocks. Disruptions in the supply chain, change, challenges to food security, the, the already mentioned refugee crisis and elevated geopolitical tensions. Um, we have seen all the sanctions already five rounds. Um, everybody more or less agrees that um, they will have an impact, um, but that more is needed. Um, and we are all looking at possibilities, all member states, including Germany and Italy. I, I saw today that Mario Draghi is going to Africa to talk about uh, gas imports. Um, and they go to the small producers, whereas um, Germany is more focusing on the big ones. Uh, but the severity of, this, of the recent wave of sanctions and what is to come is, is unanticipated. Um, so I think, um, well, as an introduction, um, we, we also see the beginning here of, of what's happening to Russia, but uh, there are so many uncertainties. Uh, but please, uh, Maria and, and Ilona, uh, complete my my words thank you well uh, maria uh, i know bruegel has worked quite extensively now on uh, the energy uh, oil and gas embargo issue and how it uh, uh, might affect the european economy but also uh, its potential impact on russia you might want to add something <laughs> on that and there yes, was also a question i think from uh, uh, some of the participants uh, it's difficult to see how it evolves. It depends probably on the severity of the uh, war um, and how the political moods in the different economy, in the different countries uh, is developing. Um, so yeah, uh, your views on <laughs> Russia-EU relations in a sense. Yeah, well, the, the Russian-EU uh, relationship, perhaps we can leave it in the end towards the mm -hmm. kind of more uh, global uh, scene because I think that's a slightly mm -hmm. different uh, issue. But uh, just to add, I mean, I think uh, uh, Dirk uh, gave us uh, some important numbers. Um, two things I wanted to add for the sake of uh, kind of understanding the dynamics of it. Um, um, I was recently struck by seeing how much uh, uh, Russia was actually preparing for something like this, and I mean preparing financial terms. If you uh, if you look at the, for example, the central bank reserves, which was uh, in no senses of the word a very unprecedented measure taking, the fact that the um, reserves of the central bank of a very big central bank. Um, were frozen of the order of magnitude of 650 billion. This is the reserves. Uh, 650 billion is just below the GDP of the Netherlands. I'm just giving you a sense of, of, of scale here because I think that's, that's very important. These assets, uh, not all of them were frozen because not all of them could be frozen, uh, but effectively half of them were frozen because they were outside uh, um, either Russia itself or because it was in assets that are not easily to, leak, to, to make liquid. They're not very liquid assets like gold. It's not very easy to sell it. Um, but if you look at other financial assets that Russia had, I mean, first of all, with the reserves, they were moving away from what I would call 
rather inappropriately actually, but I don't have a better term, Western assets into, uh, into either assets that were in Russia or in China, uh, you could really see a very considered attempt uh, to move away from these assets. You also see it in the holdings on the asset side and on the liability side. You see Russian entities, including the financial system, moving away from assets in the US or in Western Europe and just shifting all of these to, um, to either Russia or China or what they now call the friendly the friendly uh, countries assets. Um, so there is really a, a 10 year uh, uh, attempt to prepare for something like this. So, you know, try to minimize the costs, which in my, it was something that I thought was quite, um, perhaps it's not shocking given the pictures that we see now in Ukraine, but it is, it is an attempt, a deliberate attempt to move away from this and protect the internal economy. Now, Energy, of course, is key in all of this. You said, uh, Michael, we've done a lot of work at Bruegel on this. I mean, the, 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 the work that what we've looked at is primarily the EU dependence on uh, Russian assets and how much this dependence is helping sustain the war. Uh, this is really the big thing that is a big discussion in Europe. Could we you know, turn the taps off immediately and therefore stop doing this or not? And huge discussions on this and not, dare I say, in, in my view, very, very unfortunately, not an agreement on this. Um, I wanted to add perhaps one more uh, um, element here, which I happened to look uh, uh, recently at to, to the issue as to why uh, did President Putin decree that the European in energy importers, namely gas importers, be paying their imports in rubles? Uh, why, why should we, why, what's the need for doing something like this, right? And if you actually look at the, the clearing of, of the system, one of the things that, uh, the way that I understand all this is that if uh, Europe continues to pay in euros, uh, basically the Russian government does not have access to those euros because they need to be cleared in the European financial system, namely target two at the ECB. And that of course will be uh, prohibited given the sanctions. Um, and one way of bypassing this is if you find a, a clever trick of turning those euros into rubles and only with those rubles, uh, uh, paying uh, the Russian authorities. And in, in my view, the, the Russian authorities right now have great need for rubles because this is how they finance the internal deliberations. Uh, and that is why I think uh, the decree that came a few weeks ago from the Russian president is a decree of turning these euros into, into rubles. It's a clever trick. It's not obvious to me that it's going to bypass because now the European Commission and others are trying to demonstrate that even if you don't break the sanctions, uh, by doing this clever trick, but you do actually, you may be actually breaking the contract, um, which the, 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 for a number of technical reasons, we can go into them if you like, but even if you bypass sanctions, you, you break the terms of the contract by, by doing that. This is very much in discussion currently in, um, in, uh, in the EU, and if that is the case, then we are heading faster than we thought in towards banning energy from, from Russia. Yeah, and I think that's an important thing in this current juncture because, as Ilona said and others, the, the banning the energy imports is going to basically cut the lifeline to a very big extent uh, to the Russian economy and it's going to speed up uh, the impoverishment of, uh, of Russia, which is necessary for uh, uh, removing, uh, for basically stopping the war. Um, so it's interesting to see how this is going to evolve. It sounds like a technical detail when actually I would have preferred mm -hmm. to have a principial decision on this. If we are unable to have a principial decision on this, maybe the technicalities will help us. Um, but this is something that we're going to see in the next uh, few days. I, I know some governments mm -hmm. have already decided on this, others have not. Um, so I'll stop here and maybe come back if there are questions. Uh, Richard, you want to come in on Russia a bit more? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the main point, so I, I agree very much with what, what Maria said, actually. I mean, it is in a way, and I saw there's a question in the chat about the war economy. I mean, it has been something like that for about a decade, to be honest. I mean, around 2010, the sort of Medvedev years, I mean, there was all this talk about big reforms, these four eyes of, you know, innovation, infrastructure, investment, I can't remember what the fourth I was, but I mean, that completely failed, of course. And then after 2013 and the exchange of sanctions, the, prior, the, the economic policy priority has been more like a defense policy. I mean, a very, very restrictive monetary and fiscal stance all this time uh, in order to build up all these buffers, which then when the war came, half of them were frozen anyway. But I mean, there are, there are, it's not only about the reserves or other buffers as well. Um, and so in a way, it's just an intensification of that that we see now. I mean, as we go towards more of a, 
a, a, a real war economy on the Russian side. I mean, I think what there, there are things, of course, that have changed. One is the, the loss to all of the Western technological transfer that they didn't lose after uh, Crimea. And in terms of, you know, what is wrong with the Russian economy? Why does it grow so slowly? Why, why is the performance uh, so bad? I mean, it's certainly not going to get any better without access to, to Western technological transfer. And then I think all these hopes, which you see out, out of Russia, like the, if you follow the debate within Russia about the, the economic relationship with China, I mean, this is really wishful thinking. I mean, of course, there are some ways they can offset what's happening with, with China. Of course, they can eventually reorientate their gas pipeline network in, in that direction, for example. But China, it certainly cannot happen immediately, and it cannot happen um, uh, for a lot of the technological transfer. I mean, there isn't an alternative to, to the West for a lot of, a lot of this stuff. Uh, and, and this partnership with China now looks extremely unequal, and I'm not sure that's a very advantageous position for Russia to be in either, so economically or uh, otherwise. So I think it's anyway was not a great situation for the Russian economy. It is now, of course, immeasurably uh, worse. And I think especially people, so the middle classes in the cities are, are going to feel this very hard. I mean, it, it might not all be apparent yet, but it will become apparent in, in the next few months what the, what the economic fallout uh, of this uh, is. And I think, so my sense, um, it's a country where I've traveled a lot of, over the years, I know a lot of people who live there, um, a lot of people who have the possibility to leave are leaving. Um, and that, and the, that is also part of the, of the reality of the future uh, for Russia, I think. Thank you very much. Well, if we, uh, I just want to pick up a few things which some of our colleagues mentioned um, in the Institute. One is this war economy. The war economy can actually produce a certain boost yeah, uh, in purely in terms of industrial production, uh, producing more war. Uh, of course, it's something which doesn't benefit uh, welfare, but it could be a, a type of uh, GDP. But the other thing which is mentioned is, of course, becoming more autarkic. Uh, for the domestic market, as we have seen that actually in past when there were ruble crises, there is some degree of uh, diversification going on in terms of catering towards the domestic market, um, uh, while you're cut off from uh, a more qualitative uh, type of economic growth through economic interaction. The other big issue which I think gets posed for the Russian economy is that we are moving towards a type of green transition, not only in Europe, but even at the global level. So I think there is a window in which there's a very strong market power by energy providers for the next seven, eight, possibly 10 years, but this will fizzle out. So the question is what sort of strategy uh, the Russian economy has uh, if they are uh, phasing out a highly energy dependent economy. And of course the new situation is not very beneficial for making a jump towards a more qualitatively better uh, growth path. Uh, the last item, of course, which we should keep in mind is the enormous drain. Uh, well, on top of the demographic problems, which Russia anyway has, is uh, the, the enormous drain in terms of human capital, which the current crisis is exerting on the Russian economy. So many issues, actually, uh, which we uh, have to cover in terms of the future developments of, uh, of Russia economically. We will come back to the Russia-China relationship later on. So let me uh, move back to um, the EU, the impact on EU countries. I think Richard uh, talked uh, a bit about um, uh, especially uh, Central Eastern European economies, which had a bit more of an exposure actually to the crisis and also energy dependency being higher, being also in uh, a region which feels more financial spillovers in the exchange rates, uh, and of course the Baltic countries. It's interesting, of course, politically, that they are heavily engaged on the other hand to press towards very strong sanctions in spite of their stronger exposure uh, on the EU. Um, uh, I think uh, we should come now to issues related to EU policy. We've covered to some extent uh, the issue of uh, uh, gas uh, and oil uh, um, uh, boycott embargoes, but let us come to issues like um, how uh, does the EU uh, position itself in terms of next rounds of enlargements, uh, uh, the Ukraine application for accession, potentially, uh, of course, also Georgia's uh, application for accession, 
um, that precarious situation in which these small countries are in, like uh, Georgia, Moldova, and of course also uh, the Western Balkan agenda. I think some of the questions uh, posed by the audience uh, also went into this direction. And that, of course, conflicts to some extent with governance issue inside the EU, which uh, for a long time has been pushing many things of the agenda into the future without pro properly dealing with that. Maria, you are probably the best place to, <laughs> to <laughs> deal with these uh, uh, problem areas. Well, I can start at least. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think, Michael, you, you've actually phrased it uh, correctly. You placed it correctly, at least in the way that I see it, uh, in the sense that these are the big questions. I think the economic impact, direct economic impact on the EU, um, is in all senses of the world contained, certainly by comparison to the pandemic. But I mean, the trade linkages are small. I think we, I think Richard used this, showed us there some of the channels on the trade channel, uh, in particular. So the the economic impact uh, in terms of GDP, for example, is they're they're really. There are small numbers and manageable numbers given the strength of the European economies. There is the issue of inflation that, of course, all of us know, and uh, the forecast by the ECB in the worst case scenario, they could bring inflation up to 7%. There are some countries already in the euro area that have got, um, uh, not just in the euro area, but some, some countries in the EU that have got double digit inflation numbers monthly inflation numbers annualized, not for the whole year. Mm -hmm. And again, this is going to uh, depend. It can change very quickly if we can contain the oil. It will not change very quickly if we cannot control the energy. Um, but, so, but, but again, I think these are manageable, manageable things, even though um, you know, we all feel it, in our, uh, but they're manageable in terms of the economic cost. The, the, there are three things in my view that are big. Uh, that have changed a little bit the um, the approach of the EU, or at least we'll have to rethink uh, how we deal with certain things on, on three issues. Um, I think the, the first one is what Richard said, which is the energy transition in all senses of the world, that is now sped up. Um, and, and of course, as this is sped up, the geopolitical implications of the energy transition will always be accelerated, huh? because even the European Union was going into much greener economy anyway, which meant that its energy relations with its providers, Russia, but also some of the African countries, uh, will have to be altered. What is changed is that the, while this was going to happen in the, you know, in the, in the in the space of thirty years, all of this will happen in much much quicker. So therefore, the, some of these countries arguably do not have the capacity to readjust and you know reform the economies. That of course is also going to change the geopolitics of the relationships that the EU has. The second one is defense. This is something that uh, is a very new to the European Union. Uh, um, the European Union is very much a peace project. We never we never had. Uh, um, anything what we call hard power. We relied a lot more on the soft power and the hard power, of course, is something that is re relies very much, stays within the, the country's uh, jurisdiction. But this is now, the thinking is, is, is quite different. And uh, I don't know which direction this will go, but I know that it's changing. And the last one is, of course, enlargement. How do we see uh, uh, the European Union as, a, as an institution increasing itself and to what purpose? I think this is the these are the three questions that the European Union needs to to uh, to think about it, to think about. Um, or, uh, somebody somebody raised the term the peace dividend. Uh, I'm not really sure. Maybe it was Richard who, who mentioned this. The, the peace dividend of the of the past, let's say, 40, 45, 50 years. Uh, is probably now eliminated in the sense that uh, there was an opportunity cost in us not investing in military issues. Let's say, let's assume for a minute this was about 1% of GDP. If you put this over a period of 40 to 50 years, that there's a lot of gains. Now the European Union, starting with Germany first, we are going to have to invest more on defense. Um, and you know, if you take 1% of GDP, that is a huge opportunity cost for money that could have been spent on the, clean, on the green transition or indeed of uh, reforming our economies. So that peace dividend indeed uh, needs to be uh, redirected now. Uh, and then in terms of enlargement, uh, I will say one thing and perhaps I can come back into the discussion. Uh, the, the, the internal discussions at the EU had always been uh, whether the European Union should be broader or it should be deeper. This has always been the discussion and it is perceived as the two being in conflict with each other. So we cannot go deeper if we decide to go broader. So the European integration in the form of, let's say, Euro, the adaptation of the Euro or banking union, capital markets union, they are very much seen as processes that can be done by the few. 
And therefore, if, there, if we are going to do, to do them with a few uh, number of countries, then we cannot enlarge. Uh, so at the core of this is, of course, governance. How do we manage all of this? Uh, very different cultures, very different systems. How do we govern all of this? And I think it, it is fair to say that this trade-off, if I may call it this way, is still very much in the discussion. How we decide to go in this respect depends again also on the geopolitics of the new global system, which I think is very important. How does Europe see itself in terms of managing global relationship, but also in terms of deciding what kind of role the EU wants to play in the global governance? Uh, and if scale matters in global governance, then you might be inclined to vote for a more broader for a broader EU than for a deeper one. However, strength in arguments and credibility comes from very robust economic edifice, and that comes with deepening the uh, uh, EU. So these are big questions that uh, the EU is going to have to look inside in order to be able to answer. Um, but it is true that the, the new dimension, the geopolitics of, uh, of, of global governance are going to be pivotal for that. Um, yeah, perhaps I'll stop here. And in the last section, I would say about more global issues that worry me. Uh, Dirk, uh, you're next on EU and impact on the EU, but also the evolution of EU policy positions in many of these complicated areas. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Well, um, I would like to complement a bit what Maria said about uh, enlargement. Um, the last time we looked at how to do enlargement was, was in Copenhagen in 93. So that's about 30 years ago. And at that time, we decided on what the, well, the criteria were decided and, and internally in the commission, we decided on the sub-criteria based on the countries that were candidate at the time uh, and based on, on how we saw this enlargement taking place. Now, I think after 30 years and with these countries coming, it's probably time to look again at how these could be integrated, especially because as we know, the level of uh, development, but also some issues like corruption and so, um, are different dimension than, than many of the uh, new member states were. Um, we had some um, adverse experience already with uh, countries like Romania, um, but at the same time, I think in this case we have, well, this is my personal opinion, and I see that policy uh, makers are moving in the same direction. We have no other choice than offering them something. Um, so it's up to the uh, politicians to decide on what we want to give them, how we want to integrate them, how they look like, and how we can use the current system of integration, the whole dynamics of uh, progress reports and so on, um, and also how to bring them in slowly into the decision making. Um, I mean, I think this is a very complex and, and interesting uh, exercise, um, but I believe that what we have currently in enlargement is not sufficient for bringing uh, Ukraine and Moldova and potentially Georgia in. And we really need to do something. That's my point. Um, Ilona, I want to come back to you. Uh, well, uh, as you know, as you can see, uh, people who study the EU evolution of EU policymaking, they always uh, emphasize the complexity of decision-making, the differentiation across different groups of countries. Uh, and I think on top of that, if one thinks about the impact it has on the very difficult and uh, dramatic situation which the Ukraine finds itself, on top of that, there are also moving transatlantic relations, which look pretty solid at the moment, but we don't know how it looks like in two years' time. Yeah. So uh, although it is difficult to see it beyond uh, the current war situation, one nonetheless has to think about um, EU's uh, uh, relationship to its allies, yeah, which have come, uh, which have come in pretty massively in support. Even though there could be more done, but it could very well be that it's followed by a phase in which uh, a lot of these complexities of moving a very difficult uh, structure of the EU in terms of full support here yeah, uh, of the Ukraine. On top of that, in its relationship with uh, the US across the Atlantic, which uh, should really be uh, a combined force supporting reconstruction um, of, uh, of the Ukraine, makes the situation rather difficult. Ilona, how, how do you see that from the Ukrainian perspective? 
uh, well, I certainly uh, understand that I think many people in, just in Ukraine understand that um, before the, uh, the war, Ukrainian institutions were rather weak. And um, uh, probably it's no secret also that um, uh, we had a lot of Russian agents uh, both in the media and probably within the government. Uh, so there is um, understanding that not only uh, money uh, will be needed for reconstruction, but also, first of all, institutional capacity. Uh, so far, the public service reform has been unsuccessful, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I think this should be the priority, you know, continuing and um, implementing this reform and also the uh, judiciary. Uh, the, basically, the legislative framework for judicial reform is in place and uh, uh, you need only to understand and I hope that uh, there will be political will for that and um, since the government now has a, a very big rating because you know everybody is united so so-called rally around the flag uh, if you want to do, use the standard term so they will be able to introduce reforms uh, right after the war or or even uh, even now they have uh, the capacity to adopt some laws uh, or some legislation that will have a long-term impact Thank you, Ilona. Uh, let me come to our last segment in a way, which is the evolving European, but even global geopolitics and how it affects uh, European integration, uh, European policymaking, and of course, also uh, its relationship with Ukraine and with Russia on the other side. And I think we could also bring in uh, wider issues like uh, the block formations at the international level here, yeah? uh, China, Russia, Etc., and how Europe would position itself uh, in, in this context. Probably I'll start with Richard this time, and then uh, Maria, if you want to say something on the big issue of uh, geopolitics at the global and, uh, level and how it uh, does uh, impact on uh, the strategies which EU um, and uh, the important players in the EU uh, have, to uh, have to develop. Well, you've put me on the spot a bit, and it's a very, uh, it's a very good question. <laughs> I mean, my working assumption here, I think this was the assumption of, of, of all of us who worked on the paper, is that we are heading into a new Cold War uh, kind of scenario. I mean, this is a fundamental economic break between uh, Russia and the West. It is going to be very long lasting. There isn't uh, really a way back from this after everything that's happened. And, uh, unless there is a really huge regime change in Russia and a very different kind of regime, which is highly unlikely in my view, not impossible, but high, highly unlikely. And so I think we have to get into that mindset. And that has various implications for the EU and the rest of Europe and for, for economic policy making uh, as well. As I mentioned, it's one of the implications is that the whole world is going to look quite different from the, the Eastern member states of the EU, how, how the situation is now in Estonia, even compared to two months ago, what it means for investment in those countries, either foreign or domestic investment in those countries. And as I mentioned, I think, you know, the, the story of, of the US is absolutely central in this. I mean, at the moment, the US security commitment is not in doubt, but who knows how it will look after the next uh, uh, election. So I think that's one, uh, that's one element of this. What happens with China? I mean, the, the, I saw that the Chinese sent their envoy for Eastern Europe on a tour of Eastern Europe uh, just today. It was in the political newsletter, so um, trying to, to to reassure. But of course, everybody will see. I think as long as China maintains this relationship with Russia, everybody's going to see China uh, in in the region uh, differently now as well. And then I think from from the EU side. Of course, so the things, so the three things that we mentioned in in in, in the policy note, and, and that Maria also mentioned. So, I mean, the green transition has to be has to be speeded up. It was was moving anyway. There's the there's the uh, there's the defense question and the enlargement question. I mean, I have to say, I'm a bit I'm a bit skeptical on the defense question. As as you know, Michael, we've discussed it. I mean, we we I, we've heard a great deal about this Zeitenwende in in Germany, but I, I don't see 
that much evidence, to be honest. I'm more and more concerned with what I see in, in Germany on all of this, to be honest. And then on the enlargement question, I think that I can understand that there are some pretty important member states which are just not going to accept uh, enlargement anytime soon. And that, that's the reality that we're in. That, that's the situation that, that we're in. But I think if we think about Southeast Europe, and I'm sure this now also applies uh, to Ukraine, there's still huge amount more that can be done uh, uh, without full enlargement. I mean, if you look at the Western Balkans, a region that our institute knows very well, last 20 years, the economic convergence performance has been worse than any of the EU member states of Eastern Europe, apart from Bulgaria. I think I'm right in saying that that was at least the case until last year. That's despite a much lower level of, of economic development. The fact that 20 years ago, most of them, or a few of them were recovering from a war. I mean, they should have been growing much faster. Why have they grown more slowly than even, you know, countries like Slovakia, Poland, Czech Republic, despite the fact they're much poorer? EU membership. I mean, that, that is the major advantage that, that, say, the Visegrad countries have had. The EU budget, the way that foreign investors perceive those countries, the way that they're integrated into the EU market. Now, the Western Balkans has had bits of this but very much not the full package. And I think one of the, and, and then you see the lower level of economic development, disenchantment in the region, very high level of brain drain from the region, and then you know, opportunities for other actors, and I would emphasize actually more China than Russia, to come into the region because there is not enough funding for the things the region needs. There is a demand for capital, and in some ways the Chinese have been willing to provide that. So I think even if we say, okay, Full membership is off the table for a while. That's just the reality. Even though some of us don't like that reality, that's that's the reality. There's still a great deal more if the EU thinks in, in this sort of geoeconomic sense, there's a great deal more that it can do in its uh, near abroad, uh, and, including to counter the influence of countries like, like Russia and China. And I would say that you know once the war in Ukraine ends, however it ends, um, this is the kind of thinking that needs to be applied then, because again, I think you know the, the idea of full membership anytime soon is probably unrealistic. I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert on, on that, but but still, I think the lesson of the last 20 years is for the countries which are not in the EU, but as we that we want to have a close relationship with, and we see as part of a, a broader system of European integration, we have to be much more ambitious with, with, with the economic uh, part of that. And what we have found in various studies is it, it's absolutely achievable. It's a relatively small amount of money to do all of things, these things from the EU side. And, um, and I, I feel at least better able to comment on that part as well, rather than um, what it would really mean to have, uh, you know, Serbian membership of, of the EU in a political sense. It's, I think, a very difficult question to answer. Maria, uh, the, uh, it is often argued that um, external uh, tensions and the fear of uh, a conflictual situation could bring the EU much tighter together and even solve some governance uh, problems uh, in the EU. Uh, can you see that uh, happening or are we inescapably moving, uh, as you suggested, that given the heterogeneity and the widening is uh, aspect, that we have to move much more into a world of variable geometry within the EU, uh, where we have uh, sort of subgroups of countries deepening their relationships, let's say on defense, on recovery program, fiscal, uh, joint fiscal efforts, which includes, of course, the fiscal and reconstruction support for the Ukraine. Uh, similarly, on migration or refugee integration here, yeah? that uh, the current uh, situation, which has actually multiplied the, uh, the importance of uh, picking up uh, these uh, big challenges and uh, withstanding them makes this variable geometry, geometry of European integration much more likely. Um, yeah, the, perhaps I have one number I forgot to give and I'll come back to what mm -hmm. you asked, Michael, is that we have recent estimates that uh, the refugees coming from the Ukraine um, into Europe, uh, all the help that will be required for this uh, in our estimates are amounts to about 40 billion uh, euros. It, in uh, in a number for a number of countries, I mean, 40 billion is doesn't sound like a big number actually, but for a number of countries, namely the receiving countries, uh, this could be up to three percent of the GDP in any given year. So you know there is there is a lot to be done there as well, uh, and and I really think that needs to be done. Even though, as Ilona suggested, with the, you know helping Ukraine also means. You know, helping the the country itself, but certainly the people that we receive here need to be need to be looked after as well. In particular, because a very big number of them are children. Um, 
Um, I, I, there, there is an irony. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what will happen. Nobody can forecast. And I have been very wrong in my forecast in the past six years with Brexit and with the ability to issue common debt in Europe. So I wouldn't want to. to uh, <laughs> I will not want to to uh, to vote on any of this. Uh, uh, and it is a little bit of a disappointment to me that Europe changes in big ways only in, in the face of a very big disaster. Um, the good the good way of seeing that is that at least we change in the face of a very big disaster. But you know, I would have hoped that human nature is more adaptable to good change without, even without disaster imminent ahead of us. Nevertheless, Europe has changed and I'm hoping that we can meet uh, certain challenges. However, with that, I will raise a few paradoxes that in my view, in terms of the global scene, are absolutely tantamount. The European narrative of the green transition is imminent, convincing, advancing at rapid speeds. Nevertheless, the green transition is a global public good. It's not that Europe can resolve this by its own and then it's resolved. Right. We are going to have to sit around the table with China. We are going to have to sit around the table with Africa and the better relations we can have with those people that are not single minded or like minded, as we like to call them, the quicker we can come into 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 some sort of resolution to what is global public goods. Um, you know, I mean, the idea that Europe, the, the, this obsession that we have in Europe to only speak to like minded countries is, of course, good for the values, but it doesn't really solve the problems. It, it creates divisions. And, and, you know, how do we go, how do we envisage peace? What does the day after look like? I mean, that's a very important question in my mind that we are going to have to think about if we're going to address things like the pandemic, which by the way, there will be more, if we're going to address the issue of climate change. And this narrative that we only talk to the like-minded countries, whatever that may mean, and I'm not talking about European values, but I'm talking about solving the problems here. You cannot, there is only one globe. There is not two globes, there's not three globes, and we all have to live in this globe and we have to find ways of doing that. So that's that's the problem number one. The other problem which I find is absolutely essential, and here I have no authority to speak about, but I see signs of it that are extremely dangerous, is the nuclear proliferation. Uh, we are in, in, the, in the year 2022 with the US having come out of uh, a nuclear um, uh, agreements, global nuclear agreements, and now we have in China investing in nuclear weapons. We have, of course, Russia, which is in a terrible state right now, but of course a global uh, nuclear power, uh, and Europe that is investing in defense. And I mean, you know, if you were an outsider looking into the globe, you will see that the, the logic of proliferation is the driving logic now, when actually we should be talking about disarmament, we should be talking about global peace. Um, so I know I really want us to think about what this means. And, you know, when I talk about a Europe which is enlarged, which is, would be my preference, I'm still talking about an EU that is a peace project. Um, so I would like Europe, if Europe is to exercise any leadership, uh, it, it would be on ways of finding peace that is sustainable across the globe, not peace in a region, because let's face it, just peace in a region is non-existent. Unless you have global peace, you will not have uh, uh, we have uh, we have uh, sustainable peace. So you know we need to speak to China about these things. We need to find a Russia that is not destroyed, but also a Russia that is politically stable. Because I certainly agree with uh, the current regime in, in Russia, and, and you know I hope Richard is wrong in in, in his uh, pessimism about the ability to change Russia in this respect for the sake of all of us. But if you're right, I mean I think that is the number big thing that we have to resolve: the the, the change of regime into something that is. Um, more amenable to the global challenges. Um, so, you know, I would, this would be my, I, I would want a Europe to enlarge, but as, a, as a, an ambassador of peace, not as an ambassador of, uh, uh, of uh, defense. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk. <laughs> you come. It's not easy to add many things to what, what Maria has said. Um, of course, she's right, but in the short term, we have pushed in a corner um, and we want to come out of that corner. And how do you come out? Uh, is still uncertain. I mean, we don't know how, at the moment there is enormous solidarity in Europe, but uh, will this continue? In some member states, we see that it's already breaking apart. Um, then indeed, on, at the European level, we have to agree on everything. Um, some countries are more likely to disagree than others, not to, not to mention Hungary, for example. Um, and the more we are, the more likely we will find these kind of countries in the EU. So um, there is need for uh, major thinking, major consideration, uh, indeed continuing uh, talking to other parts of the world and, and open up uh, if possible and when possible, um, but it's a very difficult exercise and we don't know where we're moving to. 
Um, Ilona, let me give you the last word in uh, this discussion, probably uh, with a view of uh, what we as think tanks and researchers can do in the current situation and how we can assist actually uh, Ukraine, both analytically, but also in uh, our mission in a sense of uh, giving an input to the discussion and debate uh, in the countries or in the region where we live in, Ilona. Uh, thank you, and I would like to thank Maria for bringing up uh, these big issues, and I think uh, the think tanks uh, uh, is basically basically need to start thinking about uh, the world architecture after the war, because it's already the new reality, and it will change faster, and it will change deeper uh, than uh, probably we all expect right now. Uh, I would like to mention two things uh, uh, more. One is uh, like short term, it's uh, the real threat of global hunger in the world this year because Ukrainian ports are blocked and Ukraine was responsible for a big chunk of agricultural exports. Uh, if uh, uh, now the railroad and some other things uh, uh, just provide like 10-15% of replacement for what was exported via ports uh, of Ukraine. And the second thing uh, which is more important is now we are witnessing the final stage of demise of Russian empire. So you should think uh, about what will happen, uh, not what will happen, but how the Russia will look after the war. And uh, it will, um, I think it will fall into like maybe 20, maybe 30 independent states, nation states, uh, and uh, that you should not hope for like democratic Russia or something like that, not in the current borders. Uh, because empires are not democratic. China is not democratic. I mean, Russia is not democratic and it will never be because this is not Putin. This is the inner wish of Russian people to be like great country, you know, to conquer other states, to dictate their will to the world, etc. And um, when it happens, when uh, Russia demises into a few in independent states, you will suddenly see that such organization as ISIS or Hezbollah or, you know, things like that are getting much less weapons and financing for some reason, and you will suddenly see that such um, political establishments as, for example, Freiheitliche Freich Party of Österreich or Alternative for Germany or uh, Marine Le Pen in France uh, don't have money for their electoral campaigns uh, because those were coming from Russia. Uh, you know, it created instability in the entire world uh, in order to uh, dictate its uh, terms or uh, on in order to impose some decisions that it, it wanted and now it's the time uh, to to take back basically the world if you um, if we all hope to see the world that is governed by by rules not by the laws of jungle thank you Ilona I think we end up with an even <laughs> more dramatic and problematic uh, picture. Uh, basically, these are political trajectories. I think we were uh, all together, uh, all of us shocked by uh, what evolved in terms of the conflict situation in Europe. And I think few of us actually would have predicted that. Similarly, I think we are uh, pretty um, unclear about political trajectories in many of our own countries, <laughs> not to speak of uh, what you just spoke about, uh, the possible political trajectories of a country like Russia, China, etc. These are, I think, also political scientists, just like economists, are pretty hesitant, actually, uh, to uh, forecast uh, how, how these uh, very, very important place in the global world um, in, uh, are going to evolve. But obviously, it's clear that any sort of governance structures are dealing with the big issues you raised, uh, climate change, uh, nutrition, uh, uh, migration, refugee issues, all require a functioning global governance structures. And this, in turn, depends on the so uh, 
complex political trajectories of uh, in many parts of the world. So I think <laughs> lots for us to do <laughs> and interact with political scientists. And uh, I, I, probably one should add with uh, saying that uh, I think the Ukraine situation really deeply affected all of us. And I think we are as um, think tanks uh, will do as much as we can to continue to uh, analyze the situation, but also transmit whatever policy uh, proposals we can have um, uh, and to make our little contribution to turn things so that the humanitarian situation uh, is somehow alleviated through support uh, and um, and uh, forward-looking, I think, assessments of the situation, trying to go beyond the immediate day-to-day -day, uh, recording of the situation. So let me uh, thank you all, uh, the panelists, uh, all of you taking your time and tackling very difficult <laughs> and challenging issues for us as well. Um, and I want to thank the audience. Uh, I didn't pick up particular questions, but I followed them and I, think uh, either tangentially or directly our panelists did deal with a lot of the issues you raised but of course quite a few of them were also comments and opinions and I think I hope the audience also um, uh, captured uh, these uh, comments you made and the opinions you raised. So thank you again and it won't be the last uh, webinar on the issue of uh, Ukraine uh, of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and uh, Ukraine's prospects and Europe's position in relation to the Ukraine-Russian conflict, uh, which we are going to have. So thank you, Maria. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you, Ilona. And thanks, Richard. Thank <laughs> All you. the best. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.